All right. Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you. My name is Lorene Regan, and I am with Boom, and I am delighted to be here with you today and have you join us for our session with, on Irish whiskey tasting. I first of all want to apologize, we're a few minutes delayed there. As always, you've got these wonderful technical issues that happen to pop up. So I'm delighted we were able to sort that out. And I'd like to welcome Bruce. I'm going to introduce him in just a minute here. Uh, first thing, though, I would like to, um, to do is talk about uh, Irish whiskey. So first, uh, I'm particularly excited about this event tonight because I'm Irish and it is almost St. Patrick's Day, which is very exciting. So hopefully we're all going to learn a little bit about um, Irish whiskey tonight from Bruce. And uh, I did go and reach out to our friends at um, the Irish Embassy and I have a little bit of information on the history of Irish whiskey to share with you. But first I just want to thank Crowfoot Wine and Spirits for being the feature here today. They're going to talk to us about Irish whiskey. They've been a Boom brand partner for many years now and we're delighted to have them with us here tonight. So. Crowfoot Liquor has over 10 locations here in Calgary, and they have been, as I said, with Boom for many, many years. They carry all of the whiskeys you'll see featured tonight. And while we're doing this live event, if you have any questions at all, please make sure that you reach out to us. And uh, in the chat here, you'll see it on the bottom in the middle, there's a chat screen. Just click on chat, and then you can um, post your question in there. And then once we see it, we will at the end of it address any questions that come up. So thank you for that. Okay, so here's what I learned from the Irish Embassy, a few fun facts um, in advance of tonight. So the first thing that I learned, and Bruce, you probably know all this, so just bear with me, is that the story goes that Irish monks brought back distillation of perfume from Europe, which was adopted locally to distill alcohol. Whiskey was first regulated in 1661 in Ireland, which led to the illicit distillation of poutine, which means little pot. And whiskey comes from Ishka Baha, which is Irish for the Latin uh, aqua vitae, which is water of life. Funny that. Whiskey production in Ireland has blossomed in the last 20 years, and there are now over 30 of them producing very distinctive and successful brands, which I'm really excited for you to walk us through tonight. And in the last 10 years, growth has hit 370% with $1 billion in exports, which is not quite that of the Scottish whiskey, which there's no E in the Scottish spelling of whiskey. That is four or five times higher than that, but Ireland is catching up now. I am delighted to bring our expert, Bruce, on to guide us through the tasting of these three Irish whiskeys. And thank you, Bruce. Well, thank you very much, Lorraine, and thank you for that uh, wonderful background in history. I don't have much to add to that except to uh, point out that there are some important distinctions between Scotch whiskey and Irish whiskey, uh, as well as some important similarities. As we all know, uh, Scotch is uh, made through a process where malted barley and grains are uh, either blended or malted barley is used on its own in, in single malts uh, and then put into oak casks and uh, often peated to give it a smoky feel. Um, Irish whiskey often it uses malted barley as well, but it's unique in that it, it, there's a classic style of Irish whiskey that blends both malted and unmalted barley. So it's kind of akin to having raw and cooked apples in the same uh, dish. You get some interesting layers of complexity there. And Irish whiskey also pulls in um, alcohols that are based on other uh, substances such as cereals, grains, corn, and um, uses them all or creates this magical elix elixir, as it were, through the use of pot stills. So pot stills also go back, I think, as far as at least the late Middle Ages. And they're, it's, it, it's, um, they're, you've probably all seen them. They're large pot-shaped devices uh, in which the, the, dis the distillation of the product is done in, in, in kind of a slower fashion than what's used for scotch. In fact, scotch uses something called con the continuous method. And that's one of the reasons why scotch was able to overtake Irish whiskey production and uh, become the dominant player in the world whiskey market. Uh, when as recently as about a century ago, Ireland led the way. Um, 
And the classic expression of Irish whiskey, uh, we're gonna be tasting two of them today, is something called the single pot uh, experience or single pot whiskey. Basically, it's the malted barley mixed with unmalted barley. And in the expressions we're gonna see today, there, there's different uh, casks to use, everything from bourbon casks to wine casks to old sherry casks. And the one last important distinction before we jump into the actual tasting is the Scotch uh, or the Scots use double distillation for, the, for their product, whereas the Irish use triple distillation. An old joke amongst the Irish is that uh, the Scottish are just too frugal to go through with that third distillation. I don't know how true that is, and I'm, I'm just repeating what I've heard there. I don't know either, but I like that. <laughs> Please don't take offense, anybody. Um, what that triple distillation does do, though, uh, is create uh, oftentimes a smoother end product with a, with what we call more focused taste, uh, and we'll see that today. Uh, just a quick background of flavor categories. Uh, I'm a sommelier by training, uh, but I, I have I have studied spirits. Uh, obviously, there's a whole different area of flavor categories. Uh, with Scotch and Irish whiskey than there is for wine. So I'll just quickly run through them and feel free to jump in at any time, Lorraine. But uh, with Scotch and Irish whiskey, uh, you're going to be getting notes from things such as cereal grains, notes like cookies, new leather, a little bit of biscuits, maybe even some brioche. The fruity notes are going to run the gamut from fresh fruit, citrus, and tropical to dried, stewed. Uh, you name it across that spectrum. There's also going to be floral notes. You're going to get notes of rose, lavender, uh, grass. Uh, again, a touch of perfume, which kind of goes back to the history uh, of Irish whiskey way back in the Middle Ages. You're also going to get different uh, expressions of smoke, and that's from that peating. So for those of you who may not be aware, when uh, the barley is malted, by malting, we're, we're just talking about germinating uh, the barley to activate enzymes that will allow it to be transformed. However, that barley needs to be, uh, that malted barley needs to be dried out. So what, what oftentimes Irish whiskey and Scotch whiskey producers will do is burn uh, peat under the kiln in order to dry that substance. And uh, the type of peat they use and where it's from often is, is an important determinant in the uh, final character of the smoke and the overall character of the final product. And lastly, you're gonna get wood notes, different types of wood notes. And you'll see as we go through the tasting, uh, you know, directly from the oak that's used, as well as uh, wood what they call wood extractive notes. So you're gonna get things like vanillins, if they're using old American bourbon oak barrels, uh, more tannins if they're using European oak and so on and so forth. So enough of that. Uh, one last little note is to, I just wanna repeat, there's a wide range of cask finishes now. As Lorraine said, the Irish whiskey, the man for Irish whiskey has exploded in the last 10 years. Ireland has gone, for, I think they've added at least 10 new distilleries since 2009. And um, part of the, this new wave of Irish whiskey product uh, it involves a lot of complexity uh, that's derived from using everything from old port barrels, sherry barrels, or wine barrels, even malaga barrels, which tend to add a lot of uh, fruit and sweet notes to the, the Scotch or Irish whiskeys that, that are finished in them. So jumping right in, um, we have a customer who's just had a family reunion in Scotland, as I was telling Maureen, and uh, they, they're, his whole family is there, a large extended family from Scotland and Canada. And he talked to the fellows in Scotland who each brought their own, they all, each had their own preference of brand and age of scotch, but they all said that for scotch and Irish whiskey, it's a bit of a game of dilution. And by that we mean you need to have at least a few drops of water added to the product if you're going to drink it straight in order to activate the aromas and the tastes properly. Uh, water is to Irish whiskey and Scotch whiskey as decanting and aeration is to wine. I was going to ask, yeah, sorry, I was going to ask about the water. So this yeah. is okay. Well, I'm just going to start out. I'm just going to add a couple of drops here. We're going to start out with the teeling. Okay. Teeling uh, has been around just since 2015. They were one of the new uh, producers that popped up. Um, so literally just a couple of drops, Bruce? I, I just do a couple of drops. No, it's very personal. Okay? You have to find your own sweet spot. But at least adding those first initial drops will open up the aroma. So we're going to dive right in here. Teeling, again, is, this is the teeling small batch. 
I don't have a fancy glass. <laughs> no worries, no worries. The glass really doesn't matter as long as it's clean. So this is uh, finished in X rum casks. Are you supposed to swoosh it? Sorry? Are you supposed to swoosh it? I just smoosh it a little bit, and that just gets everything activated. It gets all the all the uh, you know the fusel oils and the, the all the, the phenols and all the other uh, good. chemicals going. Not to get too technical there. Uh, this particular one is finished in X rum casks, and it's got vanilla. And you can pick up the vanilla on there. You can pick up a bit of spice too. It's like there's a little bit of clove oil on there, and you can get the sweet rum. I'm picking up a little bit of that rum there as well. Mm. So you got I some complexity. I have to admit, I tasted it already, sorry. Sorry, what was that, Lorraine, sir? I jumped ahead, I tasted it already. No worries, no worries, that's true. We can jump right in there. It was very good. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's delicious, eh? Mm-hmm. You got some really nice warmth. This is about 46% alcohol. So um, it's gonna be higher than your standard vodka or rum or rye. And you can taste that in terms of the warmth that it generates, starting at the tip of the tongue going back. You can pick up those vanilla and spice notes, and you can also get that, I'm getting that kind of smooth, there's like a little bit of the wood there. I can kind of pick up a little bit of the oak with some light spice. There's actually a little bit of pepper on that finish. So as you can you can see, there's a lot of complexity going on. I think- A lot more than vanilla. what you think. Sorry, what's that? I for sure can taste the vanilla, and mm. Mm, that warmth is lovely, isn't it? It is. Can you get a little bit? There's a little bit of clove there too. I think I got a little, little note of clove in the nose, and then again, mm-hmm, yummy. Mm, that is. That's just delicious. And you know, I'm a wine guy. I'm an old wine geek, and I, you know, until I started getting into the spirit side and actually tasting these, I had no idea there was such rich complexity to Irish whiskey. We all know the Scotch. You know, there's various expressions from across uh, that country, but Ireland now. You know, with all these different techniques and the, the casks. This one I should point out is a blend tealing. So what they've done is they've taken the traditional malted barley and they've blended it with um, an alcohol based on corn. So that again differentiates it from a Scottish blend where you're going to take malted barley only and use only grain based uh, non-malted alcohol. With, whereas with Irish whiskey, as I mentioned earlier, you can use corn, you can use cereals, you can use grains. So that adds another dimension to Irish whiskey that just isn't present with scotch. So, hmm. yeah, so that's, does anybody have any questions? Did you have any further questions about this particular Irish whiskey? I don't see any questions coming up just yet. Yeah. Just a reminder, everybody, to make sure you pop those in there if you have any questions. I do have a question about ice. Yes. Ice or yeah. ice? So, you know, the purists always abhor any non-controlled dilution of Scotch whiskey, as it were, or Scotch or Irish whiskey, as it were. We, we sell uh, whiskey rocks. There's lots of different products out there that you can freeze or keep in your freezer and will keep the product cold without adding any dilution that you don't necessarily want. And I actually recommend those. I think when you get into some of these higher end products, they're so delicious that you want to you want to control the water content to your liking. you don't want ice sitting there melting into it okay i don't know any serious scotch or irish whiskey drinker that uses ice to be quite honest so okay. yeah that, that you can you, you can go ahead and do it uh it's not going to wreck the product for sure but as i said it's going to it's going to create some uncontrolled dilution which might not be desired okay thank you you're very welcome so what are we going to try next I think we're moving on to yellow spot, which is quite exciting. So yes. in the backdrop, yeah, the, we, we, you can see behind me the Middleton Distillery, which is the largest distillery in uh, Ireland currently. The, the shot that we have is obviously part of their original historic building, which I think has been around since the early 1800s. They've now got a huge additional high-tech operation going on there. But um, th they still... They're one of, I think, only two producers that still do a pure pot still uh, Irish whiskey. And again, by pure pot still, we mean this is a blend of both malted and unmalted barley. So you're going to get a really interesting mix of flavors on this. And in addition to the malt and, uh, you know, the unmalted dimensions, they finished it in three different casks. 
So again, they're using bourbon from American uh, oak barrels. They're using sherry, obviously from Spain, and uh, something called malaga casks, which are also from Spain, but they tend to have a few fruitier extract. They're used for different substances. They're used for sherry, but also for different substances. So you get these additional layers of complexity. One thing I should also mention is a term that you'll see on bottles called non-chilled filtered. And for the purists, again, that's, that's a desirable uh, attribute. All that means is that <clears throat> they haven't gone through uh, a, a kind of a cosmetic process to remove um, the extra distillate or precipitate that occurs when, when you take the temperature of the whiskey now. So essentially what that does is, is if you cool uh, this product, you might get a little bit of cloudiness, but they've left uh, a lot of the flavor and, and uh, other uh, interesting um, aroma substances behind by, by not chill filtering it. So again, this is uh, pure pot still. You're going to get on the nose, I'm just going to again. It doesn't, do have, it doesn't seem to have as strong a... It might be, yeah, it might be a little bit more subdued than the teeling. Let's just take, I just added a couple of drops of water there. Yeah, it's a little bit more subdued, but yeah. I'm getting a little more of what I kind of think about when I drink, when I think of a classic Irish whiskey. And then you're getting those richer, you're getting rich vanilla notes. You're getting a, almost a little touch of fruit like peach on there. I'm getting red apple. A little bit of what is that? I can almost pick up a little bit of the sherry cask in there as well. So there's some interesting complexity already on the nose. And there's almost a warming. You can tell. I think the alcohol on this as well is close closer to fifty percent than forty percent. So even on the nose, you can pick up a little bit of that warmth. And um, with this particular pure pot still Irish uh, whiskey, you're going to pick up some honey sweetness as well. You're, you're, you're going to get the richness of the fruit. You're going to get some toasted oak, and you're going to. Mm, mm. It's very warm. This one. It's very warming. Yeah. Uh, this is what I think. This is kind of the classic style in which all uh, Irish whiskeys were originally made, and you can see why it was so popular. It was popular now, of course, but uh, so popular back in the day. There's a certain richness there and a warmth, and there's a focus to that as well, too. That, and I'm not to insult the Scotch drinkers, but I don't often find that level of complexity with Scotch. Uh, with the Irish, I think it's that triple distillation given the smoothness and those additional cask finishes. You're getting some really nice complexity there. And you can feel the warmth starting about here, and it goes all the way down. <laughs> nice. Especially this time of year when it gets cool very suddenly with the sun going down. Oh, that's lovely. And I'm picking it. There's also some, a little bit of nutmeg and black pepper on this one as well, too. Mm, I so think lots, it's you know, one of the fun things you can do, especially, I know lockdowns are starting to ease a bit, but, um, it, it, you know, just to, when you're trying out new products like this, is to just try and uh, do like almost a stream of consciousness, all the different, you know, notes of flavors and aromas you're picking up and write them down. And that helps kind of train your brain and your nose to work together and your palate. Mm. So that when you encounter these flavors again, you know what you're, you're experiencing. Right. And so I, I, what are you getting on this, Lorraine? Actually, I have a question for you. Oh, yes, yes. Um, I, as they rate whiskeys, asks one of the viewers, are they looking for certain specific traits or are they open creativity like the sherry cask, even though that may not be traditional? I think what they're looking for is balance between all the elements because you can have a lot of complexity to a substance. I mean, it's true of wine as well or a scotch. You can have a lot of complexity with a lot of different elements, but if they don't work well together or if one of those elements is kind of jarringly, you know, out front, uh, that's not what you want, obviously. So again, it's the balance between the elements as well as the complexity. Uh, the reviewers, like the, the whiskey and scotch and wine reviewers, have become more flexible in recent years because there is so much innovation going on. And again, it's all about the final product and what that experience is like. But even then, sometimes they can get it wrong. I'll give you an example. I won't name the product, but there's a traditional scotch that has just come out with a five-year product 
which is unusual for Scotch because usually the minimum age is eight years. And oftentimes 12 years is considered often 12 years and above. And the five-year product is meant to be a little bit, uh, how we say rustic. In other words, it's a little bit rougher. You're not going to get the smoothness that you get with the more aged product. And customers love it. We've sold out of it now three times, but the, the, the reviews by the, the critics were just scathing. They were giving it three and four out of 10. And I think the reason why they're giving it such low marks is because their frame of reference were these more elegantly matured product when that was not the intention for this particular product at all. So they weren't really rating it on its own merits. So sometimes the critics can get it wrong. Our, every one of our customers that have bought it have loved it. And what they're doing is they're mixing it with the older, more mature product to give it a little bit more punch or power. But that's, a, that's an excellent question because there's, there's a lot that goes into creating a, a good product. And at the end of the day, you, you can have an exquisitely creative and complex product, but if nobody likes it, then it's, it's not really worth that effort. And here we can see with all three of these. I have another question. Sure. Before we... Sorry, what is the question? Sorry, you cut out there, Larry. Sorry, I have another question for you. Yeah. 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 Can you, have you got me now? I do, okay. I've got you. So the question is, um, what are all Irish whiskeys distilled in Ireland? Yes. They, there is this, so that's a very good question. By law, especially since the EU is formalized uh, or become so much more formalized over the last 20 years, um, there's a bit of confusion about things like can Scotch whiskey be, be made somewhere else? Because you can have single malts made in Sweden, they're made in Canada, they're made in um, uh, Japan especially there's some very popular single malt products there. Some of them will follow more of an Irish whiskey style where they might use unmalted barley with the malted, but technically they cannot call themselves like uh, Irish whiskey or scotch. They have to call themselves a single malt or a pure pot still product. And it's usually evident enough on the label what, what they're going after. So if they're trying to emulate a scotch versus emulating an Irish whiskey, but they cannot call themselves either a scotch or an Irish whiskey. It's the same with champagne, for instance. Uh, there's a lot of producers in California that were producing product exactly like classic champagne. Uh, but when the EU formalized its trading arrangements, uh, there were only a couple of producers that were allowed to keep the term California champagne. The rest of them had to say traditional method. Okay. Which is made, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Should we try the red breast? Yes, let's go for the red breast. So I have to say, and I, I've done, I, I've, red breast is my personal favorite Irish whiskey. Um, and I've done a, a, quite a bit of reading on it. And it really is one of the best whiskeys bar none in the world. It is lovely. Irish, sorry? It's, it's lovely. awesome. It is. It's just lovely. I and, and it first came out and it was actually quite an affordable whiskey when it first yes. came out. But over yeah. the last few years, the price has gone up and up and up. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen that with Irish and Scotch. And, you know, we've seen uh, the inflation on those, those items or those products is kind of out of step with inflation in the rest of the economy because the demand has been so high from younger, uh, like the millennial crowd. Uh, it was just not anticipated. You know, when they went into their production targets and all that, the kind of demand they'd be facing, especially from Asia as well. Asia's fallen in love with Scotch and Irish whiskey, so it's tended to drive the price or the rate of the inflation up more than their other products. But uh, Redbreast, um, basically, in the, in the 1990s, the Irish distillers uh, bought the brand from Gilby's and relaunched it as a 12-year product, which is what we're going to be tasting uh, uh, today. And they made it a pure pot still product. Um, so again, we've got that mix of, uh, sorry, pure single pot. So we've got that mix of malted barley and unmalted barley that adds the complexity. And um, this doesn't have the triple, uh, there are three different casts. This one's finished in sherry wood. Um, but it, even, even so, it's got just this beautiful complexity. It, it's got these flavors ranging from ginger to cinnamon. And you get notes of nutmeg and peppermint. Uh, even a little bit of licorice on there sometimes as well, if you can pick that up. And then you've got that lovely sherry note on the finish. So again, I'm just going to add a few drops of water just to activate the nose and the palate. Give that a little bit of a swirl. Mm. Oh, that nose, that, it's just, just beautiful. 
It's a little bit more pungent. I don't know if you're finding that, Louis. It's a little bit more pungent than the yellow spot, too. So we've got a little bit more oomph on the nose. Yeah, I find the yellow spot smells sweeter than the red brown. Yes, yeah. And I think it's those malaga barrels they use on the, on the yellow spot, but this has just got a beautiful nose. Like you're getting those notes of, yeah, I'm getting the ginger. Mm. Yeah, there's a little bit of cinnamon. Not picking up the peppermint as much, but I've got a little bit of definitely the sherry wood. And there's something warm there. It's almost like, like a camphor, I guess. And I, you know, like you're using a, a traditional vaporizer, I guess. Which I guess is not a warming stuff, but there's something there that's like, maybe it's licorice. Mm. I tasted it. It tastes amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, that's delicious. Yeah, it's delicious. That really is. I have to say that is the one of the best whiskeys I've ever tasted. I gotta <laughs> say. I'm a wine guy, but this is what I go to for, for Irish whiskey. Uh, these other two are great as well, too. Um, again, it all comes down to personal preference. Um, the Red Rest, though, uh, again, the, it, 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 it's, I think it's that mix of malted, non-malted barley that gives it a complexity and that triple distillation. And again, not to insult scotch drinkers, but that triple distillation gives it a focused taste that I don't usually find on scotch. I don't know about you, Lorraine, yeah. uh, but I, I usually, I, I usually, I, I like scotch as well, but the Irish whiskeys, this is a perfect expression of how an Irish whiskey can give you the warmth across the palate, but the focus of those flavors. It's beautiful. And, it really is. It really is. And uh, again, it's made in a batch process. I think that pot still distillation has a lot to do with it because it retains a lot of the flavors that are lost when you use that column or continuous method, as they do for, for some scotches. Okay. Now, from a price point perspective, I think they're all kind of between fifty and eighty dollars for the yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. They start around 50 so, yeah. and they go as high as 80, with I think yeah. the yellow spot being the 80. Is that right? Yeah. And I think red rest is around 80 as well. They're similar price points. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact prices in, in front of me. But but yeah, the, the, the other question here too that often comes up is, is uh, you know, value for your dollar. And, you know, it's a tricky one to, to answer because uh, people that like scotch like scotch usually. I mean, people that like Irish whiskey like Irish whiskey. But I've heard customers talk about how for 80 or hundred dollars, you can often get more complexity and more bang for your buck from let's say an Irish whiskey like a red breast than a comparable scotch whiskey at 80 dollars. And again, I don't want to impugn scotch drinkers. I'm not knocking scotch. There's some great scotch out there. Yeah. But as we've seen, we, we get complexity here and smoothness that I know personally, um, I really appreciate in a whiskey. I'm not a huge fan. There's some Canadian rye whiskeys I really like. There's some American bourbon whiskeys I really like. But um, as far as Irish whiskey, almost everyone that I've tasted so far has been a winner. So that's my personal preference, but and everyone's entitled to theirs. So uh, I have another question that came in and you sure. might've listed this off the top. So maybe they joined us a little later, but of course. how many different Irish whiskeys are there? Well, that's a great question. You know, there's not as many as Scotch no. because Scotland of course had all those years where they were, uh, um, you know, differentiating by region. Uh, and and I, I, like I said earlier, uh, Irish whiskey really had a decline due to a number of factors. Uh, you know, they could not produce it as quickly as Scotch whiskey is, is produced. There was a number of trade uh, complications for Ireland that Scotland didn't face for a number of different reasons. So that by 1972, there were only two Irish distilleries left. It was just, I think, uh, Bushmills and Jameson. And as Lorraine said earlier at the outset, there's just been an explosion okay. in the last 10 years, especially. Yeah, I think it was James, it was Middleton and, and um, yeah, and then they, they made the Jameson and yes. marketed the Jameson. Yeah. yeah. There were issues around market access, whether they're around prohibition yeah. and then the world war. For yeah. Sure. For sure. yeah. For so sure. They, they are recovering strongly. You're right though. They, they did go through a significant yeah. amount of growth only recently. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's just been the last 10 years, really, last 10 or 12 years, you know, yeah. and, and again, I think people are discovering, uh, you know, again, that value for money proposition, because for less than $100, you can get an amazing product for Irish whiskey, um, whereas uh, unless you really know what you're looking for in your experienced scotch drinker, uh, you may not have as 
pleasurable an experience. Right. So again, I'm not knocking discussion. It's just that with the Irish, Irish whiskeys, um, there tends to be, if you're just kind of new to it, your odds of finding something you like, I, that's probably part of the smaller selection too, are probably higher than if you're going through that whole panoply of Scotch whiskeys. But to get back to the main question, how many are there? We carry probably, I want to say, about 40 different Irish whiskeys. Oh, that's that's not everything that's necessarily available in the market, but it's a pretty good selection. It is, yeah. And what I know about Crowfoot is if you are able to find that particular whiskey at one of your Crowfoot stores to let the manager or somebody on staff know, your staff are excellent for, they will then bring it in. So you can go back again if it's your local Crowfoot location because you have over 10 throughout Calgary. Yeah, exactly. And they'll make sure they bring it in. Yeah. I have another question for you. Yes. Do you know if there's such a thing as craft distillers in Ireland that are making small batches? That's a really good question, you know. I did not come across any when I was doing the research for today. I know that there's been a number, like I said, I think it's been at least 10, perhaps 12 new distillers just in the last, since 2009-ish, 2010-ish. Um, my person, I, I think the capital outlay required to get an operation up and running properly and have the right quality control might be a bit of a barrier to entry for smaller players, but I could be wrong. And it's definitely a question that I'll be happy to follow up on because uh, if there are, I'd really like to know about them and see if they're available. Thank because you. Oftentimes the really cool stuff comes from those smaller craft producers. So one more question, and then I think we're gonna have to wrap it up. And it's, sure. the question is what makes Irish whiskeys collectible? As in, I would rather, I would prefer to drink, but some people would collect, this person is saying, you know, what? Because to me, it's the same thing. If I decide to purchase one of these lovely whiskeys, I'm purchasing it to eventually drink it. It might take me a while to drink it, but it's there rather than collecting. So what 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 makes an Irish whiskey collectible? Well, you know, there's a number of factors. That's a really good question. Again, I think, you know, a scarcity of production is always a factor in collectability. We see that a lot with bourbon. The bourbon industry in general, not to take too big a sidetrack, has really done a great job of managing supply for its very popular products. So as soon as they put a batch out there, it disappears and people will hold on to it. For Irish whiskeys, what you're probably going to want to look for is something that's small batch, like the Teeling. Uh, they don't make a lot of it. Um, you're looking for ageability, which really just comes down to the quality of the product. You can have very inexpensive products and doesn't matter if it's wine, bourbon, scotch, or Irish whiskey, if they're well made, you can age them and keep them on your shelf for 20, 30 years, and they're just going to get better because they have the initial quality that will keep them going through the years. Um, Irish whiskeys, I'll be honest with you, in general, you don't hear a, a lot about collectors going after them. They're really more of a drinker's product. But I would say something like a red redbreast. We've got the 12 year here today, which is fantastic, but they also make a 15 year and a 21 year. And I know that the production of the 21 year is somewhat limited and it comes and goes in the market. So sometimes what I mean by that is sometimes it'll sell out and we won't see it again for months. So something like that, uh, again, it's scarcity and quality. So like a redbreast 21, something like, uh, what's another good example? Even the green spot, we've done the yellow spot today. I think the production green spot is also produced by Middleton, but I think sometimes they limit that production. So something, if you're looking for a true collectible when it comes to any spirit of wine, you want to do the research ahead of time. There's lots of great resources out there. Yeah. Um, you just have to make sure that you cross reference your resources because some people are more credible than others out there. There's some sources that are better. We all know that. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. You're very welcome. So we have these three whiskeys here. In closing, if you had to choose one. <laughs> so, you know what? The red breast is my, I, I, really, I was really surprised by the yellow spot. Yeah. I'll be honest with you. I tasted the green spot and was blown away. I really liked it. I was really impressed by the yellow spot. All of those fruit notes and the complexity. Um, I, I'm definitely going to pick this up. And I really like the tealing as well. Um, however, my all-time favorite. So I'm, my go-to is always probably going to be red breast. So I have to admit, I always would have thought for years, I would have thought red breast. And then when I was in Ireland last, I visited the Teeling facility and very great. I enjoyed the Teeling. I've great. not had the yellow spot yet, but now that I've had all three, I don't know that I think I would be happy with any of them to be honest. Yeah, I, I, I would too. I would, I would drink any one of these present to me. I would be happy to receive any one of them as a gift. 
Yeah. I mean, I'll be quite honest. But yeah, I, I just, um, I, like I said, there's something with Irish whiskey. I was telling you earlier really, really before we went on, there's, there's just, there's almost a, there's a happiness about it. You know, I think it's maybe it's the tradition of the Irish people or just St. Patty's Day coming up that I, you, you, you don't find with any other spirit. There's lots of great scotch out there, lots of great bourbon, but there's just something kind of magical about Irish whiskey, I find. I agree. I'm a wine guy. I agree. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> You're welcome. You're very welcome. Well, uh, on that note, um, as we head into uh, March 17th, coming up here pretty quick, and yeah. that is, of course, St. Patrick's Day, I did see as well and wanted to point out that um, the Canadian Parliament just passed unanimously uh, uh, um, to have March moving forward now every year. March is going to be Irish History Month in oh. Canada, and that's quite exciting because Canada has... Um, over 4 million, I think, is the number Irish or Irish born or Irish heritage. So exciting Great. numbers there for that. So Bruce from Crowfoot Wine and Spirits, I thank you so very much for bringing You're your very welcome, Maureen. Thank you for having us. Thank yeah. you. And um, I want to remind all Boom members that happen to be watching that you do get 15% off at Crowfoot Wine and Spirits. This is uh, one of our series of uh, live Facebook events. We've done them on a variety of topics, everything from wills and estates to insurance. We have one coming up in a couple of weeks on mortgages. So you may want to come in a bit different than our whiskey one, but valuable information there from one of our partners, Mortgage Pal. So please uh, watch the channel for updates on what time that's going to be played at and where you can find it. For those of you who uh, missed the very beginning, my name is Lorene Regan. I'm with the Boom Group. And once again, I would like to thank Crowfoot Wine and Spirits as well as Bruce for joining us today. Have a great night, everyone. And we will see you at the next one. Have a wonderful St. Patrick's Day as well. Bye now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Lorene.